here. So uh, we've had the privilege to take on the care of the magical Trebek, the baby muskox, and we're very excited. And if you're new to us as well, we're the muskox farm. We're located in Palmer, Alaska, about 45 minutes north of Anchorage. And we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and so we are kind of our thing is we're dedicated to the gentle muskox husbandry, kibute production, and education for the public. So we're really excited to be able to share this with the Point Defiance Zoo. And so to tell you a little bit more about um, Shannon before we turn it over to her is our herd manager, Jamie. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jamie. Um, as said before, we're going to speak with Shannon. Uh, she is the assistant curator of the Zoological and Environmental Education Department at the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium. Um, I've had the delight of speaking with Shannon over these past couple months, figuring things out with Trebek um, and sharing pictures and um, moments and all that stuff with about Trebek and um, our herd. Um, but I will turn it over to Shannon so she can tell you more. All right, hi everyone. <laughs> so, yes, I'm Shannon Smith. I am the assistant curator of the Elephant, Clouded Leopard, Muskox area, Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, and Elephant Manager. And I have been there for just over 30 years now. Um, in that time, I've had the privilege with working with Muskox most of that time that I've been there at the zoo. Uh, today, I, I made a list of all the animals that I can remember that I've worked with, and then I came up with a list of 60. I know I've just forgotten some. Um, musk oxen are in my top five for sure. I mean, they are just amazing creatures uh, from the Ice Age. I mean, what a privilege to get to work with them. All right, let's start off with, these are things you've probably heard about musk oxen, so probably don't have to tell you, but let's do it anyway. <clears throat> musk oxen. Everyone thinks that they are like a cow or an ox or a bison, but actually they're much more closely related to goats. They're from the subfamily Capernet. So I threw a little picture up of Clover, our goat that had her birthday on St. Patrick's Day. So they're, they're actually more a big, big goat than they are an ox. Uh, musk oxen are really adapted to living in a cold, tundra environment. And this is Charlotte and Hudson enjoying one of the few snowy days that we get in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, one of the adaptations they have for living in this kind of environment is they have that beautiful long brown guard hair, but underneath is a soft wool called kibit. Um, this is soft as cashmere, more expensive than cashmere, and it's incredibly warm. During the uh, winter, we actually take the kibit that we've collected and we stick it in our pockets to keep our hands warm. And I am hoping these videos work. <laughs> uh, this is something you may not know about musk oxen. Um, it's something we learned just a couple of years ago. Dr. Blake at the University of Fairbanks is the one who told us about it. For training treats, one of their favorite treats is Cheerios. And here's Hudson to show you getting some Cheerios. And that's Piper offering him some. All right, uh, next we'll go into the history of musk oxen at Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium. So 40 years ago, this year, 1981, we acquired our first musk oxen. So first we got an area together. So we had two grassy yards, each had an acre to them. We have very few pictures of this time frame in our history at the zoo because we all didn't have cameras in our pockets like we do now. So you had to have actual cameras. So a couple of pictures from that time. This is uh, us opening the viewing hut, and that's our previous zoo director with the uh, news news cameras in his face. Uh, this is our big day of getting our muskox in. Here is the only photo I have of the six calves that came to us, and they came to us from the Nunavak Island, which is just off the coast of Alaska in the Bering Sea. We got two males and four females. This is a classic photo. Uh, Larry there was one of my first supervisors uh, at the zoo. He is still with us, so he's been in there over 40 years. And he's standing next to Penguin. She was one of the females. She had a leg injury. And so she actually went up to our petting farm section of the zoo and lived there. 
and the only other photo we could find. And luckily, this is a cute one of Kiki. So our six muskox, uh, muskoxen that came from the Nunavak Island area had six calves, and several of them were sent out to other facilities. One stayed with us, and that was Kiki, and I got to work with her. She lived with us for 15 years. And then I had to throw this slide in. This is my friend and previous deputy director, John Houck. Um, he was absolutely the driving force behind Point Defiant Zoo, continuing to hold musk oxen. So as our, as our herds got older, he would start reminding us, get out there and find more musk oxen. We need more musk oxen at the zoo, uh, which isn't an easy feat because there are only currently three U.S. zoos that hold musk oxen. Um, it's why we are so grateful now to be working with the Large Animal Research Station at the University of Fairbanks and the Muskox Farm. All right, we'll move on to breeding. <clears throat> so breeding for muskoxen or rut is typically end of summer through beginning of fall. We can actually smell when our males are coming into rut from a good distance away, like we're a block away, we're coming down the hill toward their area, and you can smell that musky secretion that comes out just under their eyes and under their orbital, preorbital glands. Um, gestation for a muskox is around eight months, but that's around because we were surprised by Trebek at seven months. We came in one morning and there he was. So it's around eight months. And here's a nice picture of Hudson and Charlotte, the parents of Trebek. They're on the left. Um, Hudson always posing, always got to do that. He's got his tongue out for us. That's nice. And the picture on the right, that's during breeding season. So you can see they're starting to um, slough off that kivia. It's getting warmer. And he is attached to her. And he will be attached to her for two months during breeding season. And if they are successful, then we get a calf. So this is Hudson. Hudson actually came to us from the University of Fairbanks. And Sarah and the rest of the staff up there were hand-rearing him. Um, we were so lucky that Dr. Blake and the university allowed us to bring him down to our facility where we took over the hand rearing for him. Uh, Charlotte, she actually produced milk, so but which was fantastic. And she was a very attentive mom, so she got to do the rearing herself. So here's a little video of her being very patient while he nurses. I hope that wasn't on your screen the whole time. I just realized there was a thing on there. All right. So what do we do after we nurse? Well, now we just sleep. So there's lots of sleeping. And then there's lots of playing. We have him uh, traipsing through the clover there on the left. And that face he gave us every time we pull our cameras out, we were quite the paparazzi with him. Again, we all have our phones with us at all times. So we'd always like, you're taking another photo? Do you really need it? Yeah, we need another photo. All right. And then enjoying the snow. So this was Gulliver, our muskox that actually came from the Alaska Zoo. He was a orphan that was found on the Alcan Highway. And the Alaska Zoo had a small female, it's the same age as him, Maya. So both of them came to us and I got to work with them for their whole life. I've been talking about shipping animals around. Um, this is a crate that Hudson came in. Hudson was only a couple of months old when he came to us. So that's a tiny crate. And this is a very enthusiastic crew that demanded to come down and they, they wanted to get their picture taken with that crate with that little musk ox, musk ox it was a It was a real privilege for them to have him on their plane. Um, why do we move them around? Okay, I had to throw this in because it's just cute. So part of the reason we move animals around is building herd strength through stirring up the genetics. I mentioned I'm also part of the team that works with clouded leopards. We've had amazing success breeding our leopards, and those cubs are so cute, and you want to keep them, and you've hand-raised them. But we realize how important it is for facilities to work together to pair them with non-related animals to strengthen the population. So we are so thankful that Trebek was able to move to the muskox farm to eventually meet a lady muskox and put his genes out into the population. So we moved them around for the good of the species. 
training. Again, I just love this photo. Looks like um, this was Hudson and it looks like he's been blown dry. Uh, why do we train? So any animal in human care can benefit from training. And there's a variety of reasons, more than it would take in this PowerPoint to tell you about. So I'll just tell you a couple of them. One of them is management. So separating or moving animals from one place to another is a big part of our day. And it is a trained behavior. For our musk oxen, we use sound recalls. Charlotte has a whistle and Hudson has a cowbell. And I want you to know, he first heard the sound of his cowbell ringing when he was way at the other end. So this is two yards. He's at the far end by that brown tree. He hears the recall. He comes. We stopped ringing then, but we kept ringing just so you guys could hear it on the video. He's like, I'm here for breakfast. Here's another reason we train. So this is Russell, one of my coworkers working with Trebek, being acclimated to being in a small space. This enables us to get up close, visually check him out. In the future, had he stayed, we would have continued to work on having him present his hooves to be inspected and possibly trimmed, having him stand comfortably in this close area for a hand injection for our annual physical mobilizations. Um, so he's been doing fantastic with that. And I, I hope that he gets to continue that up at the Muskox farm, but here's a little video of that. That's those Cheerios he's talking about. Good. Actually, that might be grain. This next one is we're having uh, Trebek step onto the scale with a target. So the target was, of course, the first part of the training and then having him move toward the target. And this is to step up onto something that was very scary initially, but he got reinforced enough times to go up onto it. In this video, he's actually watching us going, why are you filming me again? But um, he was doing a great job here with Russell. Good. Yes, we keep filming him. And this is the finished product. So Trebek was so comfortable eventually with the scale that he would have his breakfast on it every morning. And Wayne, little guys are super important because we're trying to track their growth and it's hard to tell under all that fur. So we got him on the scale every morning, especially so that we could get the big highlights like this one. On and three pounds, yay. All right, so we just saw him having his breakfast on the scale. We'll talk a little bit about diet. So this is Hudson as a youngster. And he's skipping through the grass and clover with me. And grass and clover, they are grazers, so that's the bulk of their diet. So everything that he's tropsing on there, he's going to eat. But we also supplement that. So let me show you one of the supplements. So we supplement the grazing with three different types of pellets. Two kinds are herbivore pellets, plant eaters, and one is called musk, musk ox ration. And it was designed by Dr. Blake at the University of Fairbanks. Um, this is a video of Trebek eating breakfast. And I could have just listened to this all day because those little Muppet lips eating. I hope you enjoyed as much. And I was told by someone, no one's going to know this analogy, but um, if anybody has seen Lady and the Tramp, am I that old? It's a cartoon, and there's these dogs, and they're eating spaghetti. Well, this is what it looks like. So this is his impersonation of one of the dogs in Lady of the Tramp getting spaghetti. This is actually Timothy Hay, and they are offered that every day. And then this is Dana, one of my coworkers, and she's offering him some willow. One of their favorite diet, diet, excuse me, one of their favorite diet items is willow. They get that seasonally here. We have several trees and bushes that we prune and offer to them um, every day while it's in season. And this is Dana just acclimating him to one of his keepers. She's the tree. Yep, we're filming you again. He looks over. 
And here's some more willow, mom and calf getting some. And willow really is important, so one more. Okay, next segment, enrichment. Ah, I'm going to wrap up my segment with this, and this is only going to be a tiny bit of uh, conversation about enrichment, too, because that could fill many PowerPoints. Um, enrichment is not just something we do for the animals in our care because we like to do it. We're actually required to do it. We're an accredited AZA zoo, so every species that we work with gets enrichment. Um, here's my official definition. I'm even going to read it. Providing the animals in our care with an enrichment and a variety of, yep, see, that's why I'm reading it. My official definition, providing the animals in our care with an environment and a variety of activities that promotes a range of species appropriate behavior, facilitates behavioral choice, and enhances physical and mental well-being. Yep, that's why I read that. So what does that mean? Something novel, something interesting, something that changes their day, something that um, encourages them to do behaviors that they would do naturally in the wild. So right here, I'm giving him something novel. It's a dandelion, but it's not a, not a type of dandelion he has in his exhibit. It grows just outside of it. So I brought some in for him, and he loved that. That was Hudson. Uh, during the summer, they don't usually have ice, so we provide them uh, different times of the year. But usually during the summer on a warm day, a little bit of ice cube to, to suck on. Here we have a Christmas tree. So this is Charlotte and Trebek. And, um, well, here, I'll just play it. Oh. Oh. Scary. But he was super brave. <laughs> and he went back. And then they ate the whole thing. Uh, this is Hudson playing with one of his absolutely favorite enrichment items, the green buoy. Uh, in the picture on the right, you can see him hitting it with his head. And this is an instinctual behavior for muskoxen, even at that young age. Uh, muskoxen often say hi to each other by bumping foreheads or bosses. And males bump bosses during rut to show off, try to establish dominance. So with uh, yeah, with Trebek, we saw that at like day three, he was already walking over and hitting things. So just an instinct. So we, we start him out with a soft little green buoy first. And then straw. So this is Maya. We put a full intact bale of straw into one of the enclosures and let her walk by it. This video is about 15 minutes after she's already been redecorating with it. But here it is. A swimming pool with water. I've seen the musk oxen up at uh, the University of Fairbanks really enjoying their pools. Trebek said, I only want to soak my toes. So he never went any further than this, but it was something um, just fun to do. This one was great. So Russell, my coworker who's doing training earlier, put together this uh, really cool fire hose car wash enrichment. It was in a stall that they did not have to walk through to get food. So um, if they wanted to enter the area to play with the or check out the car wash, they could. And this is Charlotte on one of the first times she's saying hello to it. She comes back for a lot more, but there's a little bit of that. And lastly... Hudson has moved up from the little green buoy, which he popped, by the way, to a big pumpkin that he smashed and then shared with Charlotte. They ate quite a bit of that. And yes, I'm ending with a photo of Charlotte's end or cutie patootie there. I'm doing that. Uh, I hope that many of you that are on the Zoom have been to our zoo, going to find Zoo Aquarium in Tacoma, Washington. If you haven't, please come see these two. 
Uh, if you are up in Alaska, we are all jealous of you. We all, my entire staff, wants desperately to go to the Alaska Zoo, the Muskox Farm, and the University of Fairbanks. So we'll all be heading that way at some point. And more willow. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And before we kind of are turning this over to the muskox, I know that you guys all have to have some awesome questions for Shannon. So Tom is wondering, what do you muskox and smell like? Well, earthy. Um, <laughs> uh, it depends on the season. So again, the males, man, their orbitals, when they're, their preorbital glands, when they are in rut, that is the, it's actually not musk, but that musky smell is so strong. Um, other than that, I guess just earthy. That's, That's a true. really great way to think about it. Hmm. Like I don't go home smelling when I work with the musk ox. When I work with um, our elephant, we often smell like our elephant barn, which smells like hay and other earthy smells. But a lot of our animals, you know, aardvarks or other animals, smell and muskogs just smell smell good oh, says, thank you um oh julie wants to know how do you name the muskox so it's usually a contest and what we've learned is we get to pick the names so a variety of names and then put them out into the world and then people get to vote on them so that we don't get what was it Bodie McBodie or <laughs> or some some ship christened Bodie McBodie or something like that I've got that wrong uh, so anyway we give a list of names so like with the clouded leopard cubs we do the same thing we get a bunch of names we put it out into the world people vote on them we were so Bodie McBoatface yes we didn't want Musky McMuff Miss see couldn't even said it Musky McMussface would have been a name uh, we were so happy people. Pick Trebek. Um, one of my coworkers had mentioned, "Hey, I just saw in uh, you know Jeopardy the other night that Alex Trebek. He was talking about what do you mean you don't know what a muskox is? It's my favorite animal." And it reminded us that he comes to the muskox farm and has supported you guys forever. And so we were so excited that we got to honor him uh, by naming that little guy Trebek. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, this is a good question. Um, and if I'll have you start it and then I can always finish okay. it. Um, Victoria wants to know, why do you keep the horns intact where the muskox farms trims theirs? And I asked the same question. Great question. So for us, we don't do free contact with our muskox. We are not in the yards with them. Um, we, we take care of them through protected contact. So Part of the reason is we don't need to because we are never in a physical space with them. So we take that. Um, so we don't do that. And our space where they move to, uh, they don't have to ever walk in a very confined space where they'd be hitting their heads with the um, with their horns sticking out. We've had to trim them if we have cracks in them or if we've had problems with horns. But other than that, we leave them intact. And now your explanation. Yeah, you pretty much um, got it. We work with these guys and are, while we're not out petting and cuddling them at all, um, we are in the same pen with them. And so they do get used to having us a little bit more kind of like near. And because of that, we do trim their horns. They don't feel it. It isn't anything um, It's going to hurt them, but we do take the tip off. It's one of the ways you can usually tell a picture of our guys apart, which is always interesting. Uh, Ted wants to know how many muskoxen are currently at the zoo and how many muskoxen are on the, the muskox farm and then at the AK Zoo. So Point Defiance has two now. Um, over the 40 years, we've had 18 and we are at two right now and our pair just went back together. You guys have a million. We have, it feels like that some days. We have 81 muskoxen and I don't, know exactly how many the Alaska Zoo has right now. It's been a while since I've been out there. I'm guessing, well, they usually have a pair and then it's just if they had a calf or not this year. And I can't remember if they did have a calf or not. So two or three probably. 
that sounds about right. But uh, go check out their Facebook. They also do a really great job of, of keeping mm-hmm. us up to date. Um, Derek is says hi. He's a student with AZA, and he's wondering: Are musk oxen any different from working with other ungulates? Is it mostly the same? Um, so let's see. I've worked with reindeer. Um, not a lot of ungulates in my career, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I mean, so they're smart. They're incredibly smart, and I, I I see that saying. Would anybody think they're not smart? that's stupid of course they're smart um they are so tractable they are um i mean again in my top five animals i've ever worked with out of 60 they're they're in there they're um different than any other ungulate they pay attention they are trainable they uh yeah i i guess i'm gonna leave it with that i mean the reindeer were too so um Lexi is wondering for you guys, what is their lifespan in captivity? So for us, um, I'm trying to think of the oldest one, probably late teens. I don't know if we've had any 20 year olds. Um, I saw a place in, I swear it was Russia. They pulled up. They said they had a 28 year old. I'm not denying that. That's just amazing. Um, but I know that you guys have a couple of older fellows. We do. Yeah. So we've kind of always said 18 ish. It would be old for our females. Our oldest one is turning. It's, it's almost birthday time of the year. So it always gets messy in my mind. 26 years old. Um, our oldest male who is a steer. So that's a little bit different. They do live longer than our bulls will it is actually turning, it's turning 21 or 22, 23. He's 23 right now. He's 20, 24. Lily is turning 24. Oh, man. Yes, <laughs> and that's all coming together. <laughs> that was a good point because, um, yes, if they're intact, lifespan is shorter for sure. Um, for instance, with our reindeer, our intact bull lived seven years, and that was like a long time. And his kids lived way beyond that um, because they were not intact. So that takes it out of them, I think. Awesome. So yeah, it looks like we got a couple more questions for you, Shannon, and then we'll we'll turn it around so that you guys can all see Trebek and his his buddies. Oh, I'm gonna turn around right now because they're doing cute things. Because sometimes they're not doing cute things, right? Right. So uh, this is Trebek and his buddy Loki. So Loki is on the left. Trebek is on the right. Um, because they're being all adorable. There's a stick between them if you need to narrate what's happening. Um, so, <laughs> and it's a beautiful, blustery day here in Palmer, which makes it extra fun. Trebek is much bigger than little Loki. Oh my gosh, he looks huge. <laughs> and these the, are the, the old men. Who are, these tell are the me old the old men. men's names again. Yeah, so this is, um, we've got Iron Man up front here, who's with them. And then Elam is is stuffing his face over here. Uh, Jamie bribed them to come say hello. Iron Man, this show wasn't about you. <laughs> He's like, no, but no. <laughs> That's an amazing boss on him. That's Isn't it? <laughs> So we'll see if we can get Trebek in the frame. And it looks like we had a, another really great question. Lexi was wondering, uh, do they climb like goats? So they do climb. Like I, I mean, they don't, we haven't had I one really climb know. over anything, but um, they definitely stand up on anything that they can get a purchase on. Have you guys ever had one climb out? Uh, not when there wasn't snow involved. When there's snow yeah. involved, they've definitely taken their moment with snow berms and been like, now would be a really great time to go for a walk. But that's yeah. about it. Mainly, they don't put forth the effort. Yeah. Well, what do you think, Trebek? Trebek. Oh, man. <laughs> Look at the horns. Oh, my gosh. So if you guys have more questions, please continue to put them in the chat for us. And we'll keep trying to answer answer questions about muskox and kind of things that are happening. Uh, Jeanette is wondering if they like peppermints. She says that her horses do. I, I don't think we've tried peppermints. We've tried all kinds of other little snacks. I think apples the other day. 
Um, no, haven't tried peppermints. That's a good, good option for enrichment. After we ask our vets if that's okay, but I bet they'll let us try a peppermint with them. I mean, right, they get so Cheerios. Our, yeah, the Cheerios would be. These guys aren't getting Cheerios every day. So what they're eating right now, and what you're kind of watching them eat, we'll see if we can get a better view. Trebek's now going to go try to find all the rest of it. Uh, so this is that kind of supplemental feed that Shannon mentioned. Um, we treat it a lot like a treat out here on top of them, of course, getting their ration of it. Ooh, Nancy has a really good question. How do the muskox handle the heat in Washington summers? And is Nancy joking? The heat in Washington? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so luckily, uh, I guess, luckily we are so far north that we don't get the the big heat spells that a lot of the country does, which isn't to say that with what's going on with the earth that we haven't had some 90 degree days here and there in the last couple of years. Um, but generally we are pretty um, moderate temperature. So we're still in their um, range for temperature, but we do give them ice or um, they don't like to be hosed. We've learned that they don't like a sprinkler. <laughs> So, um, oh, I'm going to, I'm admitting someone. There we go. Uh, and we have shade. So everywhere, uh, they can, whichever, um, yard they're in, they have shade to get into if they need to. Awesome. That's something we always think about too out here. There are very grumpy muskox behind them who are kind of wondering why, <laughs> why are they not the center of the universe? Um, Tom is wondering, have either of you ever worried about getting bumped by a muskox? I'll let you answer that, and then I'm going to let Jamie answer that after you. Um, well, we only are in with the muskox and until they, well, so my criteria is when they're as big as me, or when, like a male, looks like they're more interested in playing by headbutting. And again, it's a, it's a playing behavior, but I don't headbutt very well. So I don't worry about it because we pay careful attention to um, where we're standing, where we are when we're in with them, which I'm assuming these guys do also. So nope, I have not worried about being bumped by a muskox. <laughs> and I'm going to let Jamie, our herd manager, answer this one. Um, and for context, because we have our boom mic on that helps you hear us in the wind, she actually hasn't heard hasn't been able to hear anything else, so she repeats something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on the must so you'll have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, so yes, we definitely worry about getting bumped by a muskox. Um, but what we do to kind of combat that is we start training them when they are about a week old. So um, we go in and herd them, and we make sure um, that we are herding gently, but they also know that they need to respect us as the people in charge. Um, and we do that consistently every single week of their lives. Um, and then more so at that first year of life um, when they're calves. So it gets really more routine. Um, they know we're not going to hurt them. Uh, we're not a threat to them, but they know when we go in there, they do have to move. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's how we kind of figure things out and make sure we don't get bumped by them ourselves. <laughs> and I would say um, when we got our initial muskox, the six from the Nunavak Island, that herd, we did go in with them. So staff did walk around with them until they were adults. Uh, management over the years, we've changed that policy where we don't. Um, but we, we used to a long time ago. Um, that's Great, thank you. Uh, Victoria is wondering what the temperature here in Palmer is, and it, uh, my phone says twenty-one, but the wind. So Carrie's phone says it's twenty-one out, uh, but the wind is making it definitely chilly. So it's, I don't know what the wind is blowing. It's actually pretty calm at the moment for us, but Palmer, we're used to getting thirty plus mile an hour winds. Um, I feel like it's been very mild for Trebek since he got here. Yeah he's, been lucky. yeah, he's gotten lucky, which is good. It gave him like a, a stepping stone into Alaska. Yeah, we uh, were glad that he got three days of snow before he headed there, so it wasn't quite the shock. <laughs> yeah, we we were 
we were so excited to see the snow and you guys' photos before his arrival because we were definitely out here being like, oh, geez. And Jamie had him set up with barn access and he had a pretty cush little setup before while he got here so he could get used to the weather. But he's built for it and he's been doing great. Um, definitely built for it. Holy cow. I mean, he's just <laughs> twice as big as Loki. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a big boy. <laughs> We And just for some context of our lives, Koya here is on the other side, sticking her head through the fence so that we'll turn around and pay attention to her. Uh, because not being the center of the universe for any of these muskox is the, the a big shame as she yawns at you. Back to Trebek. <laughs> um, so this is a really good question. Erin was wondering how long you've been trading muskox with the Alaska muskox. Hopefully we didn't lose you. Is that for you guys? Uh, no, for for you. How long? Oh, have you I thought been? it said. Oh, and then how long have we been here at the Muskox Farm in Palmer? So the, the our facility has been here in Palmer since 1986. Our founder actually started us back in the 50s. Um, so we've we've been at this a long time, and we've definitely traded over the years for diversity sake out here, so that we can make sure that we're we're doing the best we can for these guys. So that they can be mean to what are you doing iron man <laughs> <laughs> so i'm sorry what was my part of the question uh how long have you been kind of trading and getting muskox from alaska oh 40 years <laughs> so yeah started with our first group and then again because there are only three u.s zoos that have muskox right now um truly the muskox farm the university of fairbanks uh and Alaska Zoo are kind of it for us right now for trading uh, muskogs. So we are very happy you are there and have so many. We're happy that we have other facilities to talk to because it, it's otherwise pretty lonely in the muskox world when you mm -hmm. start to think about it. So we all have to figure it out together. And now these guys are like, we're done with this. <laughs> But we've got a couple more questions before we're done with all of you guys. And we'll we'll turn it on Koyok's butt for a moment because she's scratching nice. at the fence trying to prove her point. Um, and Catherine is wondering if you have any plans to breed Charlotte and Hudson again now that Trebek has left the nest. That's an excellent question. So we just put them back together. Um, introduction went really well because they hadn't been together since Trebek landed. Um, not sure how to answer that yet because we're still deciding what we're doing and talking to the muskox farm and the university and the alaska zoo to determine if we did have another calf if we didn't keep it would we want to go ahead and mingle it with another herd again so we've got a little bit of time it's only march and breeding season should not be coming up until august so we're still we're still making those decisions Awesome. We have a question if there's any gene flow between the muskox farm and wild Alaska populations, and there isn't. So uh, part of our mission as a nonprofit is to work with these guys every day so that we can actually comb them for their kiviute in the spring, so their undercoat. And so because of that, our animals are used to routines. They're used to farm life. They feel very comfortable around people. And so ours would be a nuisance in the wild and bringing other muskox in um, is just not something we're set up for if they're not a muskox that has already been used to being around humans a little bit. Um, which kind of leads into Lorian's wondering if we, the muskox farm takes in rescued muskox from the wild. And we don't because there are other facilities here in Alaska that do an amazing job taking care of orphaned muskox. Um, so that, that role has been filled by two other fantastic facilities who are taking care of that, that do a great job. Uh, Derek is wondering, Shannon, are Hudson and Charlotte part of the species survival plan? So they are in the stud book. To my knowledge, there is not an SSP for musk oxen because they are not critically endangered. Um, I don't, yeah, I'm, I don't think there's an SSP for them. But they are part of a stud book, so all muskox, I think, in the world are on that stud book. We still track everybody and who who's the lineage of all the muskoxen. 
Uh, Jeanette is wondering, and probably either one of us, uh, how many musk oxen are still in the wild? What's your number? So I can tell you that Alaska has, generally speaking, about ish, 4,000 ish. Ish. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a hard number to track. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know that I say much different than that. I, I do say, again, that they're not critically endangered right now. And if you pull up muskox on a computer often, um, it tells you where you can go hunt them in the wild. So that tells you how not critically endangered they are. But um, yeah, muskoxen are really cool in that they're a species that most people don't think about. Um, and so there's not as much research on them. They also live in a place that can be difficult to research. And so if you're not the charismatic megafauna that's getting all of that, um, it can be hard to know numbers. But I shouldn't have seen not threatened or endangered at this point here in Alaska. There is a, a legalized season for these guys. Um, and we're still learning more and more every day, which is pretty cool to work with an animal that we're still learning about. And at one point they were critically endangered. So they came back from that. Yep. So they, they did. Yeah. So Hudson actually got his name from Hudson Bay where they were transplanted. And I mean, there were no mus muskox there for a great deal of time transplanted there, took off, same on Nunavak Island. So people have had to intervene to help this species. And luckily that has worked. Elam over here is trying to take over the show now. And Koyuk is back over here. So in case you need a play-by-play -play of the corner that is the pens we're near at the muskox farm. Uh, Koyuk here is fine. She can actually get her head through the gate, but we like to cough and pretend we're stuck so that you get to be the center of attention, um, which we are exploiting right now, which could be why they still do it. Uh, <laughs> we had a, a question about Kivyut and what we do with it. Um, I'm happy to briefly answer that for you. Uh, so Kivyut is their undercoat. So muskox have, have several coats on them, but the main ones are guard hair that you see, that beautiful flowing coat that they treat like a raincoat. So it's their weather protectant, their bug protectant. And under all of that is kibute that keeps them warm all winter long. It's what makes them into these beautiful giant fluff balls. In the spring when that sheds naturally to try to keep them cool all summer, um, we do comb it off of them. And then we have it knit into garments. That product that's knit then goes back to help kind of keep our farm going um, at this point. And uh, if you want to know more about all that kind of stuff, feel free to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. Um, and we do offer tours and visits first virtually and in person. I promise usually our virtual ones are a little bit more like figured out. I'm not sure why Zoom was being our enemy today. Um, probably because it was Shannon, it was your first time, so it couldn't go smoothly. <laughs> yeah. It's not your fault either. We'll just go with that. But you did amazing at it. Um, does anyone, before we say goodbye to Koyuk and Trebek, and Shannon, Trebek is once again walking away with his <laughs> cute butt, uh, have any other questions that Shannon or us here at the farm can answer for you? And if, we'll give you guys a, a second to do that. And we, I just realized we didn't like do an update on how Trebek was doing because we just saw his cutie <laughs> camped face. So maybe Jamie will give us a quick update while he walks away. Yeah, so Trebek has been doing great. Um, when we first got him here, he was in a week of quarantine just to get used to everything, um, kind of settled in. And then he got put in with these three three hooligans. Um, and he's been doing wonderfully. He's been herding really well out with the group. Um, and he has gone through the barn a couple times. And so uh, he's been eating treats in there. And he's going to get ready to be combed just like the rest of our animals here. Awesome. Thank you all so much for tuning in and dealing with all of our technical issues. Hopefully cute muskox made up for it. And thank you so much, Shannon. We feel so lucky to um, have been given Trebek and to be trusted with his care, but also to have you on here sharing and getting to know you a little better. 
Yeah, no, thank you. And again, my entire staff at some point will be up there. <laughs> Fantastic. We all can't wait to meet you guys in person as well as all of you guys virtually. Feel free to keep up with both of our facilities. We love to be able to share all of the wonderful things these angels are doing. We hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. And then am I ending this? <laughs> I think you get to end it. That's so exciting. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. See you in the house. Bye. <laughs>